Okay, so maybe we'll start. So we were uh, we had been talking about products and then in particular about completeness. which, as I said, was supposed to replace uh, compactness for variety. So, uh, so the, the definition was that uh, the variety X is complete. <coughs> if, uh, if I take the second projection from X, um, X times Y, Y, then this is a closed map uh, for all varieties Y. So that means that the image of any closed subset in the product with any Y, if I project it down to Y, will be closed in Y. And you know, <coughs> And uh, as we had seen, so we had shown that um, one thing that if X is complete and uh, F from X to Y is a morphism, then we find that the image is always closed. So um, this is also a property that you have for uh, uh, compactness. No, if you have a compact space which has a map to a Hausdorff space, then the image is always closed because it is compact. So <coughs> now we want to give some. So and we had finally the big theorem was that uh, any projective variety complete. So this was um, a somewhat more tricky theorem that we proved. Essentially, one had to see it short only in the case of Pn. And then uh, it was finally reduced to some kind of linear algebra statement by using the uh, projective Nullstellensatz. OK, so now we come to some corollaries. So this would be new now. So first, <coughs> if uh, so let x be a projective variety, uh, then if I take the functions which are regular on the whole thing, then these are just the constants. So uh, any regular function on the whole of x is constant. So that's quite different from the affine case, where we knew that the regular functions, for instance, on a n are all the polynomials in k, but here it's very different. There are very few regular functions. I mean, if, if I assume them to be regular everywhere. The second statement is every morphism from, um, so say, phi from x to y from projective variety to an affine variety maps the whole of x to a point. So 
that means there are essentially no morphisms from projective varieties to affine varieties. If I have a morphism from a projective variety to a affine variety, the only possibility is that everything is just mapped to one point. So in particular, so, so in particular, if x is a fine and um, projective, so a fine means that it's isomorphic to a closed subvariety of a fine space and it's also projective, then it follows x is a point. So they are, you know, the fine and projective varieties are really something very different. Okay. So this is uh, quite simple. So, and in fact, uh, it all follows from the first. So assume we have a regular function. So let f be regular on the whole of x where x is a projective variety. So that means that f a function can be viewed as a morphism to a1. This is the same thing. So f is a morphism. So by um, this statement here, as x is complete, it follows that f of x is closed in A1. But um, uh, so what are the closed subsets of A1? So they are finite sets of points, A1 or the empty set. And f of x is irreducible because the image of something irreducible. So it follows that f of x is a point or f of x is equal to a1. Now we have to exclude that it can be a1. But that's simple. So via the embedding, um, for, of a1 into p1, say a1 identified with u0 or something, we, we get that f gives a morphism f from x to p1, which, however, we know maps everything to a1, you know, because the image is the same as before. So uh, the image is still closed. So f of x is also closed in p1. But obviously, a1 is not closed in p1. Closure of a1 is p1. So it follows that f of x is a point. Okay, so this proves, uh, so f of x is a point. So in other words, uh, the function is constant. So uh, the second statement is kind of clear. So if, uh, so y is isomorphic a closed subvariety of some e n. So if I compose with the, with this isomorphism, I can assume that y is a closed subvariety of e n. Well, then we know that a morphism from anything to something in an is given by an n-tuple of regular functions. So thus, phi uh, can be written as f1 to fn, where the fi are functions which are regular on the whole of x. But we know then they are constant.
So they are, each of them is just constant equal to some number ai. So phi maps everything to a1 to the point a1 to n. So that's uh, also very simple, and the rest is clear. If x is a fine and projective, then the identity would be a map uh, to which this applies. And the identity map would be supposed to map x to a point, and so x itself is a point. So, as I said uh, the other time, the fact that the image of a morphism starting from a projective variety is always closed, so a subvariety of uh, uh, whatever you map to, uh, gives us a, a new way to construct variety. So, if I have any variety in the morphism from that to some projective space, so any projective variety in the morphism from that to some projective space, then the image will also be a projective variety. And so, this is a way to construct many projective varieties. We want to look at one example, which is uh, the Veronese embedding. Again, uh, after some Italian mathematician Veronese. And that's rather simple. It's somewhat similar to the Sege embedding in some way. So we fix two numbers. Why? No, we fix just one number. So we fix a number, um, say, D and N. So some positive integers. And we put um, n to be uh, the number n plus d choose d minus 1. And um, so we want to, <coughs> want to construct a Veronese embedding, which is nu d from um, Pn to Pn, um, the Veronese embedding of degree d. So how does it go? So we want that the coordinates here correspond to all the monomials of degree d in the coordinates on the original Pn. And that is precisely the correct number. Um, and so So, so let mi from say x zero to, of x zero to x n for uh, zero small equal to i small equal to n be all the monomials of degree d. Um, well, in x0 to xn. And then we define wvd, so this new d, I suppose new d before, from um, n to n as given by all these monomials, m0 to mn. OK, so just the. the the ith coordinate of an image point is just the, uh, the, the, they are somehow numbered in some way. 
is the ith monomial of degree d in these coordinates evaluated on that point. So I claim this is a morphism. So to be to define a morphism, this should be all homogeneous polynomials of the same degree that they obviously are. They are polynomials of degree d. And they should have no common zeros on Pn. So that's the only other condition. So uh, and that's easy to see because we can just choose a few one of those which already have no common zeros because already x0 to the d until x1 to the d xn to the d, which certainly are some of these, they belong to these, have no common zeros. Because x0 to the d is 0 if x0 is 0 and so on. So these have no common zeros. So this is, uh, defines as a well-defined morphism. And so we get uh, mu d of um, pn. Um, is a closed subvariety of P large n. So in this case, actually, one can show that this map is an isomorphism onto the image. Maybe I will not. So claim so new D as a morphism from the N to its image is an isomorphism. And this is basically because one can uh, define the inverse morphism. I just do it locally. So if we look at um, so the open subset ui, so this is the points of all uh, a0 to an in pn such that ai is different from 0, they form an open cover of pn. So maybe I will not the other end. And so maybe I give a name to the coordinates on P large n. So say for any monomial, of degree d in P zero of to be n. Um, we may be right, so this monomial is called M. Maybe I write ZM for the corresponding coordinate on P large N. Now you see that according to this, the um, coordinates on the large Pn correspond in one one correspondence with the monomials of degree d in x0 to xn. And I just, as a notation, I index them by the monomials. Okay? It's just the way, you know, I, the only thing that I know is that there are large n such coordinates. I can call them whatever I wanted. I call them Zm, where m is the monomial. Okay? So <clears throat> then, I can form, say, ui tilde, um, which is the set of all points, which is the, which is pn minus the zero set of z xi to the d. So, 
uh, what is it? Yeah, that's a bit so there are two different sets. Huh? So there's a large Z and a small Z. So this is the set where the coordinate corresponding to xi to the d is non-zero. So this is obviously an open subset. Not Pn, new d. Open subset of new d of Pn. And this ui tilde form a cover. of uh, new D of P. Because uh, we have kind of used this already here, we know that uh, on Pn, at least one of the coordinates is non-zero. And uh, if these, you know, if we are in the image, then at least of one of the xi to the d is non-zero. No? Because uh, what we started with one of the coordinates was not zero. The corresponding coordinate xi to the d on the p large n will be non-zero. So these form an open cover. And we see, so and um, we see that phi, no, which phi, no, nu d, if I restrict it to ui, is a map from ui to tilde i. No? If the ith coordinate here was non-zero, then the coordinate with xi to the d will be non-zero there. And so we just want to give always the inverse of this map. So, and uh, this new d, so give inverse of new d restricted to ui. And this is very simple. This is just, so it's given by well, I say uh, you just take um, say z x zero zero to the d z x zero. So the d minus 1, x1. Ah, so I assume here, for simplicity, assume that i is equal to 0. You can do it for any other i, obviously. Then this is given by z x0 to the d minus 1 xn. So <clears throat> why is this the inverse? So if we take the, uh, if we start from ui, we map uh, x0 to xn to x0 to the d Uh, I mean, to, <clears throat> to, you know, to, to all these things. And then if we go back, we just have to, um, so, so this inverse map, so if I look at this, this will just map, so if we would start with A0 to En, then it maps to, uh, to all these tuples. And then, <coughs> so the C M of And then we project this just to A0 uh, to the D, A0 to the D minus 1, A1, and so on, A0 to the d minus 1 an. But this is the same. 
as a zero. So to a n, no, because we just have to divide by a zero to the d minus one. And you can also check that it works the other way around. If I start, um, that's a bit more. What? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's the misprint. Thank you. OK, so this is I only, you have to check whether that the other, uh, also the other composition gives you that. So if I, OK. <coughs> um, OK, so we, we find this. We have, so in particular, let's just give some, uh, so one thing which occurs often is the case that n is equal to 1. So, so the simplest example is uh, so the map nu d from p1 to pd. So if you work it out with the, the numbers for n equal 1, you get just pd. Uh, and the map now is just, the, if you look at it, you take all monomials of degree uh, d in two variables. So we have a, so a point a0, a1 is mapped to a0 to the d, a0 to d minus 1, a1, and so on, until we finally get to a1 to the d. And so, <coughs> The, the image curve is usually called nu of d of p1 is called a rational normal curve. So this is just a curve which is isomorphic to p1, but somehow it lies in pd. And um, this is considered because it often gives a counterexample to some things one might, might think to be true. And uh, another uh, case is if you take nu2 from p2 to p5, um, then uh, the image is called the Veronese surface. Again, it is considered because it often uh, gives an example of something one would not expect. <laughs> OK, so this is uh, this example. There's one kind of application. So we have seen here that the, <clears throat> in some sense, the the coordinates on this large Pn correspond to monomials of degree d in, um, in the coordinates on the original Pn. And this will lead to the fact that um, if you look at the intersection of P small n with a hypersurface of degree d in the image, in the Veronese uh, in the image under the Veronese map, this will correspond to the intersection with the hyperplane. And that somehow simplifies things sometimes. So let me write this down. So let f equal to some ai mi. So mi again, our monomials, i equals 0 to n, n. Your homogeneous polynomial. of degree d in x0 to xn. OK. So now let x subset pn be a closed subvariety. Then I claim. It's kind of obvious, but I want to 
it. So if I look at new D, so the image under the Venezia map of X intersected the zero set of F. Then I claim this is equal to the image of X under the Veronese set uh, uh, map intersected the zero set of the hyperplane sum I equals zero to N A I Z M I. Now if you think of it, this is completely obvious. You know, because the the image of uh, so it's just the map is just given by sending by all the monomials of degree D. And so you find precisely this. If I take X in the, if I take the intersection of X with the hypersurface of degree D, it's mapped to the intersection of the image of X with the hyperplane. Now these are just the coordinates. It's a linear combination of the coordinates. I mean, so this is direct, essentially directly from the definition, even though it maybe looks a bit strange. So we know that nu d is an isomorphism onto its image. So this allows us sometimes to restrict, to um, reduce questions about intersections with hypersurfaces to intersections with hyperplanes. We can use this to reduce questions of uh, about intersections with hypersurfaces to intersections with hyperplanes. Because after taking the Veronese embedding, intersection with the hypersurface becomes the intersection with the hyperplane. So we give an application. So that is not just theoretical nonsense. So let X in Pn be a projective variety. So let F be a non-constant homogeneous polynomial of degree, so homogeneous polynomial of degree D. Of degree, say, D bigger than zero. So then first, so F is uh, obviously in X0, KX0 to Xn. Then the first statement is that if I take x minus the zero set of f, this is an affine variety. Okay. And uh, the second statement, which actually f follows, if x is not a point. then the intersection of x with the zero set of f is non-empty. So if you take, that means if you have any sub-variety and you intersect it and it doesn't happen to be just a point, so any positive, well, then the intersection with, the, with any hypersurface will be non-zero. So it's kind of a very strong uh, 
a strengthening of the fact that in projective space any two lines meet. So we have something much more. Anything which is not a point with a hypersurface will always intersect. And we will uh, later make use of it when we talk about dimension. So let's um, try to let's prove this. This is a relatively straightforward application of the above. So first, so if f is a hyperplane, so the degree is 1, we can apply yeah. a projective transformation Uh, so such that the image under, of F under the projective transformation is just the hyperplane at infinity. Uh, so I could say maybe, well, Whatever, it doesn't matter. So we could write A to Z of F. This is equal to the zero set of X zero. And then, obviously, we know that X minus zero set of X zero is uh, just the open subset U zero, which is isomorphic to A n, or we can, uh, can view it as A n. So, um, so P n without and um, x dissected x without the zero set of x0 is equal to x intersected an, which is certainly a fine. And um, this projected transformation is an isomorphism of Pn to itself, so uh, it follows that it's also true uh, before that. Okay, so we can, so by the project transformation, we reduce to the case that the hyperplane was just the hyperplane at infinity, and then it's obvious. So th this is the, and now if it's not a hyperplane, we apply the Veronese map. Um, if f has degree v, Um, so we see that X without the zero set of so via the Veronese map, we have that uh, X without the zero set of F is isomorphic to X minus a hyperplane to new d of x minus a hyperplane, which is just uh, the hyperplane which was uh, you know, obtained in this way here. And so, and therefore new d of x minus a hyperplane is a fine by, the, by what we already saw, so this is a fine. So for the second statement, it's just an application of the first. So assume it's not the case. So if um, x intersected the zero set of f is empty, we have just seen. So what do we have then? If we take x minus the zero set of x, This is after all just like equal to x. Then this is a fine, and it is projective because x is projective. Okay. 
Thus, it is a point. And so this is precisely the statement here by contraposition. Now, if we say that if the conclusion is false, then the assumption is false is the same as, as saying that the statement is correct. OK, so this uh, proves this. OK, so this is uh, everything I wanted to say for the moment about completeness. So what we for the moment say about the product. And now we come to one uh, more topic about, in some sense, morphisms, which is rational maps. So this, uh, we want to do this relatively fast, uh, maybe a bit more than one lecture. But I mean, now half the lecture is over, so we're not expecting to finish today. Uh, so rational maps. So, I mean, we have these morphisms. We have introduced these morphisms because we want to use them to study varieties. So they are somehow the, a tool that we use to study them. You know, under we apply the morphism, we see what happens, and we find out something about the varieties. So the problem that we, in some sense, have with this is that there are not very many morphisms. So, for instance. I mean, for instance, we have this, we have just proven that, you know, from a projective to an affine variety, there's basically no morphism at all. It maps everything to a point. But in, in general, it's difficult to construct morphisms. You know, you, you have this condition, you have, if you have a projective variety, you want to map to another projective variety, you have to find so and so many polynomials, homogeneous of the same degree with no common zero and whatever. And, you know, that's just not easy to find. And so, <coughs> We want to try to make do with something which is not as good as a morphism, but it's easier to construct. Okay? And this is a rational map. And that's something quite simple. It's kind of almost a morphism. Namely, it is a morphism which is not defined everywhere. So there's just an open subset of the source where it is defined, a non-empty open subset. Okay? And uh, so... <coughs> And then the morphisms we had before is just a special case where this open subset happens to be the whole of the variety. And uh, it actually, we will not really come to that, but if uh, one is doing more advanced, you know, later, the way how one actually usually construct morphisms is to construct them as rational maps and then prove that they're defined everywhere. So it's uh, somehow, <laughs> uh, it is actually the way how one does it. Well, so, you know, so if a function for us is always a map or a morphism to K, to the ground field. And we will prove that a rational map to the ground field is the same as a rational function. Okay? But, you know, I always call fun, you know, it's maybe my personal viewpoint, but uh, for me, and also in the usual language in algebraic geometry, a function is always thought as a map to the ground field. And a map is always to another variety, and, um, or a morphism. But, so it means that rational functions are a special case of rational maps. But you know, that we'll have to see. And they are actually quite, we will find out that they are quite closely connected to rational, rational maps, and rational functions are closely connected. So, lemma. So first, before starting, we need to, I want to, uh, so that everything is reasonably well defined, we prove a small lemma, which in principle we have already done, but I want to repeat it. So if phi and c are two morphisms from x to y, of varieties, then, and, and we assume if um, there's an open sub, a non-empty open subset, U, 
in x such that phi restricted to u is equal to psi restricted to u, then it follows that phi is equal to psi. And if you remember, we have in some sense already proven this. We have, namely, we have proven that if we have two morphisms from x to y, then the set of points in x where phi of p is equal to psi of p is a closed subset of x. And now we are looking here at this closed subset and have the condition that it contains a non-empty open subset. Now we know that any non-empty open subset in a variety is dense, so it follows that the closure of it is the whole of x, and that proves this. Okay, so this we already have proven it, but it's, uh, anyway. So now we want to define a rational map. And it's slightly more complicated than what I made you believe. Um, so a rational map. So maybe I can basically say what the idea is. So I said a rational map is a, a morphism which is defined on an open subset of the target. But we don't want to care about which precisely what open subset that is. So therefore, a rational map will be an equivalence class. So where we call two such things equivalent, you know, so where a, a rational map, so a, a representative will be an open subset plus a morphism from that open subset. And we call two of them equivalent if on the intersection of the open subsets they are the same map, okay? But this is just, it basically just says it's an a morphism on open subset and we don't care about which open subset. So a rational map f from x, and it's usually done with a broken arrow, is an equivalence class Um, so, so I write u comma phi of pairs. So u and phi, where u in X is non-empty and open. So there's an open subset in X, and phi from u to y is a morphism. And as I said, the equivalence relation is that two of them are equivalent if on the intersection they are the same map. So here, say u comma phi is equivalent to v comma psi if and only if um, phi restricted to u intersected v is equal to psi restricted to u intersected v. Okay, so <clears throat> obviously when I say I'm talking equi about equivalence class, one has to see that this is an equivalence relation. So exercise, this is an equivalence relation. If you, you know, you have to see uh, symmetry, which is trivial, reflexivity, which is trivial, and transitivity, which is not trivial. And to prove the, the, the transitivity, you use this lemma. then it's actually quite simple then. <laughs> so I, I mean, I just, so we say that uh, say this map, U, this rational map, U psi, 
is defined by, say, V psi if this is representative. So if it's one of the things equivalent to it. So, so now that I have made this complicated thing with the equivalence classes, I want to tell you that I could have also done it in a different way, which is in some sense easier. Namely, instead of saying I say it's a morphism on an open subset, and I don't want to say which one, I can instead say it's a morphism on an open subset, which I make as large as possible on a maximal open subset. And uh, so, <coughs> so that cannot be further extended. So you, there's kind of one best representative always. And so this is as follows. So let um, phi from uh, x to y be a rational map. say, uh, defined by, you know, phi on an open subset, then, uh, then the claim is phi defines a morphism from an open subset, so phi, I still call it phi, from the, what I call the domain of phi to y, so with um, where the domain of phi will be the largest open subset on which I can define it. And it's just what? So the domain of phi. So I take the union over all. So I take another one which is equivalent, which is in the equivalence class. So we take all V psi, which are equivalent to u phi. So that means that psi restricted to intersection is equal to that of v. Okay. So it's just, uh, so I take any function which on the intersection of u intersects, so which is defined on some open subset, such that on the intersection with u it is equal to phi, and I just take the, the union of all these open subsets. This is an open subset. And how is this morphism defined? Well, just whenever I am in a V, I take the corresponding map. So, so by, so, so we define, define phi of a point P to be equal to be, say, psi of P if, uh, we have that V psi is equivalent to U phi and uh, P is in V. And obviously you have to see to, to show that this is well defined and amorphous. morphism. And it's kind of clear because, um, you know, to be a morphism means there is a neighborhood of the, you know, that for every point where it's defined, it must be morphism in a neighborhood, but it's given by, by morphisms. And um, 
so we have to see it's well defined. But so if we have a point P, which lies in two different such open subsets, then it means it lies in the intersection of, uh, of the, so on, it lies maybe in V1 and V2, and we have C1 and C2. So then it's a point in this intersection of V1 of, and V2. And um, we know that C1 and C2 will be equal to each other on the intersection. No, that is, uh, will again follow from the transitivity of the equivalence relation. So it is well-defined morphism. So we can, instead of saying we it's an equivalence class, we can also always extend the rational map to the largest possible open subset. And if this largest possible open subset happens to be the whole of X, then Psi is actually a morphism. Well, yeah, so it's somehow glued. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can say, yeah. But, but uh, yeah, you could call it, we, we kind of glue it, yes. But, uh, you know, in some sense, it's just that the equivalence relation is such a way that you just, uh, but, yeah, you sometimes call this gluing in more complicated situations. Okay, so let me see. So, first, then, so I have some remarks. So the first one is what, uh, what uh, you asked in the beginning. So uh, the rational maps from x, so f from x or a1, are the same as the uh, are the rational function. F in Kx. Namely, um, so if F in Ox U. Uh, for some open subset. So if f is an element in Kx, then it follows that f is regular on some open subset. So, namely, you can always write it as a quotient of, of two uh, uh, elements, say, in the coordinate ring, and then the, uh, if where the denominator is non-zero, it is regular. Um, and so, thus F is a map a function or a map. And so it's a regular, it is a rational map to A1. And you also find that the equivalence relation you have on both sides are the same. You know, we had seen that if two rational functions coincide on some open subset, then they are equal. So it's somehow the same story. Uh, conversely, if um, f from um, if uh, say if say uf Uh, from um, x to a1 is a rational function, a, r a rational map. Well, then, uh, while well, we see, we can just reverse the steps. So we have f from u to a1 is a morphism. Thus, f is an element in Ox of u. And so F is also an element in Kx. And as I said, the equivalence relations are the same. So you know the 
the two things are the same as elements in Kx if and only if they are the same as rational maps. So it's really that uh, the rational maps are the same as rational functions. So you can use this to look at some other examples. So if x is a variety, and um, we take any elements, f1 to fn in kx, then we get a morphism then uh, say f1 to fn from x to pn, so maybe uh, an, is a morphism, is a rational map. And so, so these fi will be regular on some open subsets, which I maybe call the domain of fi. So this is the set of all points where you can write fi as a quotient of two regular functions so that the denominator is non-zero. And so, um, so it is a morphism So from the intersection, i equals 1 to n, the domain of the fi, which is some open subset of x, to an. No? And uh, we can also do the same in the projective case. So let x in the n be quasi-projective variety. And we uh, take some, uh, say, and f0. to fm uh, some rational functions um, then say I write f0 to fm from um, Uh, x to pm uh, is a rational map, which is defined on some open subset. Namely, the open subset will be uh, uh, the points where all of these functions are regular. So each of them is regular on some open subset. So they will be there will be the intersection of them is still a non-empty open subset, and they have no common zeros. So therefore, I must have that not all are zero. But just uh, very different, you know, um, before it was very difficult to, you know, <coughs> you know, for instance, to have morphisms, but now you can just take any rational functions, anything, and this will always give you a rational map which is defined somewhere. And uh, here it's in some sense even more extreme. This could be a projective variety, so you know there's no morphism, but you know you have an enormous supply of rational maps. You can there are always lots and lots of rational functions. No, the rational functions are the same as that on any open subset. And um, for, for any tuple of them, you get a morphism to an, whereas you know that there's basically no morphism at all. OK. Um, and we can do this also in a different way with for polynomials. So we have the same. So we have the same assumption that x and pn are variety, and say f0. So 
fm p uh, polynomials homogeneous of the same degree. So, yeah. And they are not all in the ideal of X. So not all of them vanish identically on X. Uh, then F0 to Fm from X to Pn M is a rational map. So we don't have to worry whether these things have common zeros. As long as they are not all identically zero on X, we always get a rational map. Okay. So, for instance, in just a stupid example, so say we take projection from a point, so we have P equal to the point zero, 1 in Pn. Then we had the projection from, we can look at, we had talked about the projection from a point if we have a subvariety which does not contain the point. But we can instead also define the projection from a point as a map from Pn to Pn minus 1 as a rational map. So Pp, uh, so projection from P. So this is P equal to x0 to xn minus 1. And this is a map from Pn to Pn minus 1. And in this case, we had seen this was just, uh, the map was just given by taking any given point in Pn and taking the line from that, which connects that point with this point and intersecting the line with the, with the hyperplane. So the map is actually defined everywhere on Pn except the point P. So the, the domain of P. Okay, so <clears throat> now we have these rational maps, but you know, usually, you know, if you have maps, you want to compose them. And now the problem with these rational maps is that they cannot always be composed. And that's kind of obvious because, you know, a rational map is not defined everywhere. So if you have two, two maps, and the first map maps everything to the locus where the second map is not defined, then you, know, you don't have a composition. So you want to avoid this, and you avoid this by only considering uh, maps where the image is dense in the target. So then this problem cannot happen, okay? Um, yeah. How much? Mm -hmm. Seems to be. So definition. A rational map. Uh, so phi from x to y is dominant well if in a suitable sense its image is dense in y so you can say this if uh, I could call it phi of the domain of phi is dense in Y, 
and you can check as an exercise, or it's also in the notes. Um, equivalent is so if um, say u phi is a representative, so u is any open subset on which phi is defined, any non-empty open subset, uh, then this is equivalent to the fact that the image of the domain is uh, dense is equivalent to the statement that the image of u is. Uh, this is equivalent to So the statement that the image is dense uh, if it holds for one open subset holds for all open subsets. So now I want to define the composition. So let uh, phi from x to y be a dominant rational map. So, and um, so assume that it is defined on U. So, an open subset U. Um, and psi, a, more, a rational map from Y to Z, a rational map. Then we can define the composition. Um, so say defined by find on some open subset V of Y, uh, then it follows that if I take the inverse image of V under this map, if I take the map from U to X to, to Y, then this is a non-empty open subset of U. Then U intersected phi to the minus one of phi is uh, a non-empty open subset of U and therefore of X. No, obviously phi to minus one of V, if it's the only question is whether it's non-empty, it's certainly open because the inverse image of an open uh, set by morphism, I mean the morphism on U. So this is a non-empty open subset. Um, and uh, we can define our rational map by just uh, this as a representative. So if I take the pair u intersected phi to the minus one of v. And on this, I define psi composed phi. This is uh, from x to z is the composition. So I get a rational map, which I've now defined to be, you know, I have given it some open subset on which it is defined. We don't know precisely how big uh, the maximum open subset might be. It might be much larger, but there is an open subset on which it is defined, and it is that's what we call the composition. And then uh, the domain of this would be the maximal open subset on which I can extend it. In many cases, this might be the whole of X. 
but uh, even if it's not true for the individual pieces. So in particular, we can do this if the second one was a rational function. So we can use rational maps to pull back rational functions. Okay. So this allows to define the pullback of rational functions. So let f in Ky be a rational function. Then, uh, and uh, let uh, phi from x to y be uh, a rational map. So then we have again the pullback. So we have uh, phi star. Um, so this here I would call psi composed of phi. No? Psi star of f is defined uh, to be phi f composed with phi, which is a rational function. So a map from uh, x to a1. OK, so one would do the same thing. One finds uh, some open subset on which uh, phi is defined. One takes the uh, inverse image of that open subset and intersects it with a set on which uh, f is defined. And then you know, from this to there, it gives a rational function. OK, so we have this pullback. <coughs> and. Um, Again, we can easily see that this behaves nicely. So that's a homomorphism. So if we, um, or a factor or something, so easy to see. If you take phi star from ky to kx, so phi, so I should say that it's not a rational map, it's a dominant rational map. No? So for dominant rational maps, we can define the pullback. So phi star from there is a homomorphism. So if we you know, take a constant function, it pulls back. So actually, homomorphism of k algebras. Uh, if we pull back the product, it pulls back as a product of the pullbacks, the sum as, as the sum. OK. So I'm a bit faster than I thought. So. <clears throat> Now, you know, we want to, uh, so we had before defined what an isomorphism between varieties is. It's a morphism which is an inverse. And if two varieties are isomorphic, then in many ways we kind of view them as more or less the same thing. You know, I mean, they have all the same properties. Now, we have this rational map, which is a bit less than a morphism. And we have... A, so therefore, we can also have something which is a little bit less than an isomorphism, which is a, a birational map. So that's a rational map, which has a rational map, which is inverse to it. And in that case, we call uh, the two varieties birational. And that means 
equivalent to the statement that they contain open subsets which are isomorphic. We know that in a variety an open subset is dense, so if two varieties are birational to each other then they contain open subsets, non-empty open subsets which are isomorphic. Now if you, you know, the point is that in Zariski topology, topology open subsets are very large. So it is a non-trivial statement that they contain open subsets which are isomorphic. If you are in differential geometry, if, they, if two manifolds have open subsets which are, isom which are isomorphic, this says that they have the same dimension. So that's not very exciting. But, uh, you know, here it is, uh, it is a much uh, more interesting notion. I mean, it means really that they are almost everywhere isomorphic. And so we have introduced this. So definition. So a dominant rational map Uh, say phi from x to y is called a birational map. So it's again if it has an inverse. So if there exists another dominant rational map. Say if and only if there exists <coughs> another dominant version map, which I just call phi to the minus one, phi to the minus one from y to x such that the composition of them is in one direction the identity of x and the other one the identity of y. So such that uh, uh, phi the minus one composed is phi is equal to the identity of x and um, phi composed with phi to the minus one is equal to the identity of y. And here, so I should say this is, they are equal as rational maps. So what this means is that wherever this is defined, you know, this is, so when, when, I, when phi is defined and maps into uh, where phi to the minus one is defined, um, the composition will be the identity. But that means that if I extend this composition to its maximal domain, it will be the identity on X defined everywhere. Okay, and the same here. So it, it is not necessary that phi is defined everywhere or that phi to the minus one is defined everywhere but the composition is automatically defined everywhere if it's the identity. Okay. So X and Y are called birational or birationally equivalent if there exists Uh, a birational map phi from x to y. Okay, so let me see what I can do now. It's just five minutes. So the next thing would be some theorem, which is a bit tricky. So one special case, which uh, so in particular, 
a variety will be called rational if it's birational to a n for some n or the same birational to p n. So the variety is called rational if it is birational to a n for some n. And uh, so you can see that, uh, example, we have that, uh, well, obviously, a n is rational, and p n is rational. No, because we have just uh, the embedding of a n to p n is a very rational map. Um, If I take, uh, um, say, the caspital cubic, um, so C, which is the zero set of y squared minus x to the 3 subset A2, this is rational. Because we had seen that there's an open subset of it. So we have an isomorphism from an open subset to another open subset, if you remember, to, to A1. So because um, if I take the map from A1 to C, which sends, uh, um, so it's, I could say it's given by t squared t to the 3. So this is a morphism, and the a, a bijective morphism actually, and the inverse is a morphism on C without the point zero zero. So we see that we have an inverse rational map. No, that we had seen before. And finally, if we have Pn times Pm, this is also rational. Because we have an open subset. We have seen that it contains open subsets which are isomorphic to An times Am. No, contains. So at this point, you might wonder whether maybe all varieties are rational, which would be a little bit uh, disappointing. No, I mean, we cannot be sure. But in fact, uh, in a very strong sense, most of our varieties are not by rational, are not rational. It's a kind of a special thing to be rational. So I think, for instance, I cannot prove it because that's actually, would actually be difficult. But I can just say if I have, um, well, I cannot now write down the equation, but if you have a, a general, so do I manage to write this? So if um, f, c in k, x0, x1, x2, uh, is a General, I don't say what general is, but somehow if you write down one at random, polynomial of degree homogeneous polynomial of degree D bigger equal to three, uh, then 
the zero set of f is not rational. I haven't told you what general means. It means, uh, for instance, non-singular. We have to see. So if we take the... Um, <clears throat> So I, I will not explain this now, but anyway, so we have um, uh, one can, there is a certain, but anyway, maybe it's enough to say for any d bigger or equal to three, there is a polynomial, in fact, many of degree d, such that the zero set of f is not rational. And actually much more uh, is true. I mean, there are very many different kinds how things cannot be rational. I mean, usually they will not be well rational to each other. Okay. So anyway, maybe that's uh, enough now. And then uh, next time we will say something more what uh, being birationally equivalent has to do with the uh, uh, function field. And then we will talk about particular, uh, briefly talk about particular rational morphisms Birational morphisms, so these are morphisms such that the inverse is a, that they have a morphism as a rational map, uh, which are, is the blow up, which is a very important construction. I mean, in general, we are not going to use it very much, but I just want to introduce it briefly. Um, and then this will finish uh, the story about um, the rational maps, and we will uh, start talking, start a completely new topic, which is dimension. So, uh, you know, how to define dimension, how to compute dimension, and then we will find that now we actually are able to say something about it and uh, make some theory because we can use these, what we have learned about morphisms to study, uh, study the dimension. Okay. So, see you on Wednesday. No?